on board with the importance of self-esteem, and so we don't know that. Well, um, <laughs> Don Ward was born and raised in Africa, has studied in Italy, the UK, and the US. His father moved from Africa to Chapala about 25 years ago, and while visiting his father, John fell in love with the area and decided to retire here. He spent the last years, among other things, making a movie. Let's welcome John Ward. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Salim. Great Canadian accent there. Edmonton, Alberta, right? Yeah. Okay. What was read earlier when D.B. read that verse from uh, Leonard Cohen? My God, that has a lot to do with the subject, self-esteem, obviously. Um, I want to start with this disclaimer. This is a huge field, a huge iceberg floating in the ocean. I'm not only going to be able to talk about the tip of the iceberg, I'm going to be able to scrape the tip of the iceberg, because as you can imagine, self-esteem is just enormous. It's a very, very big subject. That's one. Number two, I'm going to talk in generalizations, and as you know, there are exceptions to every generalization, except the one I just made, that there are exceptions to every generalization. <laughs> but I will be talking in general, not specifically, so I will mention things that are generally applicable, if you or someone you know is, is not conforming to this generalization, that's absolutely acceptable, that's understandable. I'm just talking in generalizations. All right, so self-esteem, where does it come from? You know, I should take this off. Okay, sorry. Um, <clears throat> okay, it has been postulated that we all have an inherent inherent sense of inadequacy, an inherent sense of inferiority, and this comes from the fact that when we are born, our brains develop far more quickly than our uh, physical motor skills, unlike animals. Um, your brain develops when you're still having to rely on somebody to provide nourishment, somebody to put you on the toilet, somebody to clean you up, etc., etc. And an unconscious sense of inadequacy uh, kind of um, fosters because you feel and, and you get irritated as a kid as a child you get irritated because and you don't know why I mean it's unconscious but it's frustrating you can't do for yourself and so it's been postulated that that's where it starts and, and then of course as you grow up it's how your parents react to you and what they say uh, things that are understandable from the point of view of an adult in other words you go over and you push the vase to see how hard it, you have to push it for it to fall. They go, what are you thinking? Are you an idiot? <laughs> now, to them, yes, that's an idiotic thing to do because they know how much it costs. Uh, they went to the trouble of buying it, and uh, only an idiot would push it over. But you're a kid, you're experimenting, and so sometimes they make that disconnect, and they may say a word like that. As you're growing, you're trying to find out, who am I? Where do I fit? How... Uh, how intelligent am I? How uh, capable am I? And words like that really hurt. Compliments, for some reason, don't make as big an impact. They do make an impact, but they don't make as big an impact as criticism. And so one has to be very careful with children in particular. Their matrices are, you know, young and still trying to set, and they're trying to decide how they fit and how, how they are as human beings. Wow, it's bright. Okay. I should have printed this on yellow paper or something else. I, I, yeah, I, but I, that's, a, that's rude to you guys. Okay. okay I'll, I'll do that. That's, that's a better suggestion. There you go. Okay. I'd like to wear it like this. Um, only fools do that. <laughs> yes, I know, I know. Uh, okay, so uh, we reach an age um, where, and, and of course, we start to develop a I'm the center of the universe feeling because our parents, you know, you say, ah, oh, God, I hurt myself. They run up and help you, and um, everything, all your needs are catered to. So you start to get a sense, hmm, 
I'm, I'm, I'm very important, I'm the center of the universe. And then we get to the, our teens, and all of a sudden we realize, well, in my case, my teens probably are younger <laughs> for you people, but you realize, I'm not the center of the universe. It's devastating. You realize you're part of a bigger thing, and uh, you're not that important, or as, as important as you thought. I'm feeding back a little bit. You might want to drop the volume just a touch. Okay. So when you're young, too, you want to blend in. You don't want to be, uh, when you go to school, you don't want people going, oh, you're weird, you know. Salim, your accent is weird, you know. So you try to blend in a bit, and you, you try to dress the way the other kids dress, and, and uh, talk the way the other kids talk, and have the same interests, and that sort of thing. Then some of us, we can't. We, we are just different. And so... Uh, one reaction is to completely go the other way, dress all in black, wear black lipstick, uh, you know, pierce your ears. It didn't work for me. Um, <laughs> but of course, then you get still comments now from peers and teachers. You know, don't be stupid. Can't you get anything right? Uh, it's, it's very hard on a child growing up. Uh, others blend in very well. But then later, they say, I don't want to be just part of the homogenous mass. I want to be individualistic too. So we do little things to make ourselves stand out. For example, um, you, you spell your name Allison, you spell it A-L-Y-I-S-M-I-T-H. All those letters are silent. You know, it's, just, it's to make it a different. Jackie is Jackie. Uh, Patty is Pat I. You know, with an E Y E at the end, and it just it just kind of distinguishes you slightly. So we want to not only do we want to be able to blend, but we also want to distinguish ourselves. We want everything, and that's understandable. That's how we are as humans. Um, if you truly want to fit in, any diversion from the norm is a detriment to your self-esteem. Are you too skinny? Are you too fat? Uh, for example, I'm I'm way too skinny. Uh, to blend in with the herd. Actually, if we were a herd, I'd be the, the one the lion would try to knock off and live on this guy for about a month. Um, do you have too many pimples? Are your eyebrows too bushy? Since the human race places more emphasis on visual uh, cues, in other words, we have five senses, but we don't go around licking people. Mm, your taste good. Maybe we should. But, um, <laughs> Dogs have something, but uh, no, we place a lot of emphasis on visuals, so a lot of our self-esteem comes from how we look, an inordinate amount, not, and you know, as, as we know, there's more than just that, it's how you are inside, what kind of a person are you, if you're a decent person, you know, I don't care, you might be so handsome like Salim, but you could be a real jerk, you know, or you might be really ugly like me and be a nice guy. <laughs> Okay, so, as individuals, we have to, as we have become, we now look outside ourselves to see what relative de degree of individuality we've achieved. Um, there are society, society creates ideals, okay, and we look at that, models of happiness, the family unit, two kids, two cars, this is as we're growing up, I have to kind of skip ahead. Um, uh, a, a house, membership in a club, a uh, society, uh, a hobby, uh, how many of these things have we achieved? And then we start to judge ourselves. Our esteem comes from comparing ourselves with other people, which is wrong. Because if I compare myself um, with this lady right here, who is a brilliant saxophonist, I'm going to go, man, I cannot play the saxophone. I'm, I'm terrible. You know, I had a girlfriend actually who did that. Her name was Kay. I won't tell you her last name, Colvin. Okay, anyway, she, uh, we dated. She came back to Africa to uh, stay with me for a while. And when I was, I was just a kid, I was somewhere in my 20s. And uh, I, I play guitar and I sing. Not very well, but it amuses some people. And she would sit there and fume at concerts I'd give. And uh, I used to say, what's wrong? I don't understand. Well, everybody's paying attention to you, and I just feel so left out. I'm going, okay, you are a great artist. She was a wonderful artist. Not only, uh, you know, pencil drawings and that kind of... 
I can do stick figures really well. I, in fact, I think I won my wife with a stick figure drawing. I won't, I won't describe it to you because it's a little bit naughty. But <laughs> Kay uh, was a wonderful painter, a wonderful artist. In fact, she's in, she lives in uh, San Diego now, and she is an art uh, artist, living on her art, and a gallery manager, I believe. Anyway, um, and I say, you know, we're, we're together. My victories are your victories. Your victories are mine. You know, if you're painting and people are going, oh my God, look at that painting. I go, yeah, I, 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 I have that girl as my girlfriend. I'm pretty good, huh? Look at the painting she can do. I mean, I, to me, that's, you know, it's, these are common victories. Okay. When you compare yourself, there will always be someone who's better than you in something. Let me give you another example. I can ride a horse. I used to, as a kid, I, I was a champion uh, show jumper in gymkhanas in Africa, and I, I rode against the Portuguese army. They send in a contingency of people and these beautiful horses, completely shaved, so you can see every muscle and every vein, their manes and tails braided with uh, uh, the Portuguese colors, which are green and red. And uh, I, m me and my horse, Blaze, he had a Blaze, so his name was Blaze. <laughs> hey, and it was usually in the winter, which in Africa, well, in, where I lived, it was in, in June and July was the winter. Our summer was December. And his fur was, well, he looked like a bloody yak. And I'd, be, and I'd go on this, this poor horse, this poor hat. He was so wonderful. And I would win, I mean, against these fantastic riders. So I know I'm a, I'm a pretty good rider. Um, I'm a lousy fisherman. I cannot fish to save my life. There's a great show on Discovery with this blue-eyed Englishman, very handsome man, Jeremy something. And I love to watch that show. Has anybody seen that show? Yes? Good-looking guy, he, he goes off to River Monsters. No. I mean, this is one of the most exciting shows to me, and I know it doesn't appeal to everybody, but he goes fishing for these big bloody fish with teeth like this, and they're eating South American people. <laughs> anyway, I would love to be a good fisherman like that. that. That's like a fantasy. I can't fish to save my life. I mean... I'll put a line in the water and apparently it has fish repellent on it because everybody else around me is catching fish as I... I mean, I could sit there my whole life and I wouldn't catch a fish. Anyway, so there are always things you're great at. Like Wendy can play the saxophone, but how are you at show jumping? Okay, so you don't, you don't, you know. So it's, it's a, kind of a fallacious thing to, to compare yourself with people other people because you're always going to be worse than them in something but you're always going to be better than them in something else and the thing is to reward yourself by acknowledging and recognizing where you are better okay look at clothing models i mean they have set up because these poor uh, starving um, uh, what's that horrible disease anorexic women make the clothes flow nicely or whatever. Now, this is our model of beauty. Generally, they're very beautiful women, but by God, do they need a sandwich. <laughs> Say that. Um, and then women are going, God, I, I want to be beautiful, and that's understandable. Now I've got to lose weight, I've got to stop eating, I've got to, you know, and this is awful. I mean, we set up these models for ourselves, and it's just impossible to achieve. Well, unless she, she's achieved it, but... Uh, yeah. <laughs> okay. So, um, in France, this is an interesting little piece of information that's come out just recently. In France, uh, the government has banned super skinny models. It's a great idea, but how are you going to enforce that? You know, could, uh, you say, I'm sorry, you're too skinny, so you can't be a model. Yeah, I don't know how they're going to enforce that, but they're saying we've got to get away from this horrible anorexic look and we've got to get to, um, you know, normal women with curves and things. Go figure. Uh, okay, so women who look at those women, with one or two exceptions that I can think of, feel inadequate. And this is wrong. This is so wrong. The self-esteem is damaged. Uh, even if only on an unconscious level, even if you're not conscious about it, you know, you might be thinking, you might just wish, kind of, you, you know, there's a nagging in the back of your mind, but you don't know what it is, and you just feel uh, 
inadequate in that one way. So, unfortunately, visual stimuli are very important in, in self-esteem. Okay, so let me go back because I left the heading on this side. Uh, how does low self-esteem affect us? Um, there are many obvious ways it affects us to our detriment. A child who grows up with low self-esteem tends to marry the first person that asks them because they think, nobody's going to ask me. I, I, I've got no value. And so some guy, you know, who's cleaning the sewer in the hut, you want to get married? Okay, <laughs> certainly, somebody wants me. You know? um, whether the person is decent, intelligent, accomplished, has potential, is kindly, educated, has a sense of humor, is tolerant, considerate, altruistic, talented, thoughtful, etc. None of this, these are not the judgments they make, they just want to feel they belong. The person with low self-esteem will accept spousal or partner abuse. This is often the case, believing they deserve it. Can I get an amen? Amen. That's true, right? I just happened to notice someone in the audience, and we'll be talking about very high self-esteem in a minute. Uh, another uh, manifestation of low self-esteem is the unquenchable desire for attention from cars with loud, booming speakers. I mean, you know, that's a, please pay attention to me. I mean, it's a cry, it's a pitiful cry. Please look at me, please. <clears throat> yeah, I'm not interested in anybody, just, I want to damage my brain. Anyway. <laughs> to um, things like uh, Munchausen syndrome, or Man Munchausen by proxy. Munchausen syndrome is needing attention and saying, you know, like, I'm very sick and I've had operations and, uh, I, I'm having a heart attack right now and getting all the attention you can um, by proxy is where the woman, you know, is like smothers a child, her own child, and then the child is screaming the place down because it, it hasn't died but it's been, it's under terrible distress and people rush in and there's all that attention. This is a, this is a, 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 a cry for attention because these people just don't get enough attention in their minds. Okay. Cutting. Cutting is uh, not for attention primarily. Do you know what cutting is? No. Okay, for those of you who don't, some kids, but also some adults, cut themselves and make themselves bleed. And you'll see the scars and things. And this is because they have so much pain, and the pain of feeling inadequate, feeling uh, inferior. All these pain, all these pains, I guess, can be consolidated into one pain, the physical pain of cutting, watching the blood, they often say, it feels like a release, like I, I concentrate the pain there and the pain's flowing out of me. So these are some of the, you know, the, the awful effects of having low self-esteem. It's also illustrated by Groucho Marx, when he said, I wonder if you can, anybody, can guess? Yes, try. I, I never belonged to an organization that wanted me as a member. Absolutely. He said, I would never belong to any club that would have me as a member, okay? Now, what is that? I don't know if you've ever had this experience. Uh, I have. Um, do you know the expression, familiarity breeds contempt? Okay. That means, uh, I know you, so you can't be a great anything. Are you great at something? Okay. Well, what is it? <laughs> He's a very good lover. Oh, 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 so writer, writer. <laughs> okay, so he's a very good writer. Now, um, let's say he writes something. I can write too. I wrote a, a children's musical, wrote all the music, all the words, everything else. I was living in this little town, and I s submitted it, and the theater wouldn't do it. They just wouldn't do it until Finally, this doctor who lived in the same town said, I'll, I'll, I'll do it. I, he says to them, I've read this, I've seen the music, I've played the music, it's great, we need to do this. So finally, they took his word, they put it on. We turned people away because it was so popular. Their revenue spiked over my play. And <laughs> so, I mean, because this man can write, and because, let's say we were friends and familiar, I said, what's your name, please, sir? Terry. Terry. I know Terry. You can't be that good. Why? Because I'm not that good. You see? Because nobody good would know me. That's, this is, when people uh, do that, when familiarity breeds contempt, it means 
that your low self-esteem makes you denigrate their abilities. It's like that guy over there with the white hat not listening to my lecture, <laughs> Alex Bertin, <laughs> is a brilliant writer. He's written seven books. He has produced movies. This guy is huge. He, he knows everything. His mind is a database of all the movies ever made, ever produced, ever screened, plus all the porn movies, but, it, <laughs> but no, of, of all the legitimate movies, he knows it all. This guy is amazing. But because, well, I know Alex, he can't be that good, that's, that's low self-esteem. And uh, when I put my, my play on, uh, my musical, we got to a point where I wanted to uh, advertise it, and they said, well, you can't advertise it uh, this far before the play actually is on. I said, but we're advertising this play. It was the Amadeus, you remember? About Mozart, right. He says, well, Mozart and your play. I said, wait a minute, Mozart didn't write Amadeus, for God's sake. Some schmuck in New York wrote Amadeus. And, uh, you know, Mozart would say, oh, this is an original play, you know, he'd, he'd be very happy to have it. And mine's got music. Mozart would prefer that. But anyway, those are the things you run into, and this is terribly destructive, especially to creativity. Okay. I dropped this page, so I don't know where the hell I am. Um, problems you will run into if you do develop self good self-esteem. I'm going to talk about this before I tell you how to raise your self-esteem. The problems you will develop is, if you have confidence, people will say, well, oh, he's so arrogant, so conceited. You're not, you're just confident. People say that about me, and I really care, as you can tell. But, um, <laughs> but that's a problem you will run into, that you're arrogant and you're conceited. So what you have to do is you have to try to uh, create uh, a modest high self-esteem. Now those sound like, that sounds like an oxymoron, doesn't it? Yeah. Um, be great, be a great writer, but don't necessarily sit in the front row. Yeah. <laughs> I'm joking. No, but let other people speak. Let other people tell you about themselves. That sort of thing, you know? Um, the, you'll, you'll always run into that, and people who feel a sense of inferiority, and it may not be their fault, it may be the way they were brought up, and the inability to keep paper on the bloody lecturine, um, <laughs> they will always feel that. If you develop confidence, they'll resent you for it. It's, it's normal. People are always comparing themselves to others. Okay. Um, they'll say you have a narcissistic personality or you're narcissistic just. These are the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune that you have to endure. Um, if you're hurt by these accusations, as I am, uh, it doesn't mean that you don't have self-esteem. We're a communal animal. We, we live in a community. And we care about other, what other people think. I mean, if I didn't care, I wouldn't have combed all this hair this morning <laughs> to look good for you, you know, and put my makeup on. Um, now, we care what other people think, and that's normal, and that's natural, because we are a communal animal. And if someone says, by God, that guy's ugly, well, they, they're telling the truth, but it still it kind of hurts me a bit, you know? Now, I wasn't always ugly, I'll have to tell you that. And one thing my father did, which I'm really uh, very lucky and uh, grateful to him, was when I was a young boy, and my libido was off the charts, he, he told me this thing. He said... When you go to a party, go for the best looking girl. And I used to say, what? Never, no. He'd say, why not? Because she, she's got all the choice in the world. She'd never pick me. Say, That's the problem. The best looking girls are often the loneliest because of our low self-esteem. We don't go for them. So they stand there looking gorgeous and, and nobody bloody will hits on them. So all the gorgeous women who were lonely, if they were scared, we were scared because we think, you know, oh my God, that, that, that person would never go for me. So I forced myself and by God it worked. They weren't always the best uh, companions. <laughs> but 
up for my ego. They were very good. I was walking out with the best of you girls. Yeah, they're much taller than me. Uh, because they were grateful anybody would pay attention to them. They, they, they'd go home and go, what the heck is wrong with me? Nobody hits on me. They're all scared. Keep that in mind so that you know your self-esteem doesn't get damaged by that. Anyway. Okay, so. Even if people criticize you, you, it doesn't matter. You're doing it for yourself and for your children, or in some cases for your grandchildren. You are boosting your self-esteem for yourself. And if people say, well, you're conceited, say, well, I disagree. I'm, I'm confident, but I'm not conceited. Uh, I, know, I know my failings, and I know my ability to succeed. Um, you're better off having positive self-esteem than not. Um, and then I say, but be modest. If you can, if you know that you're good at certain things, for example, you may be a great fisherman, okay? When you fish, and you catch a lot of fish, acknowledge your ability, acknowledge your, your terrific skill. You know exactly when to pull, to hook the fish, and you know exactly how much pressure, and not to break the line, or whatever the magic is. Acknowledge that, but then don't, like to all the other guys in the boat, especially guys like me, hey, look, I got number 19. <laughs> got any fish yet? <laughs> That's arrogance. That's conceit. But confidence is you hook it in, hook it in, after a while, say, okay, that's, that's not fish for me. Boy, I've been lucky. You give other people a little bit of a boost. Okay, how to develop self esteem? How good am I on time? Who's in charge? Oh! Okay, leave. 10 minutes for questions. You have 10 more minutes. Excellent, okay. How to develop self esteem? This is probably the most important thing. Realize, recognize, number one, how unique you are. Every single person sitting here, every single person, including me, we're unique in every way. That man right there is very unique. <laughs> Wonderful human being right there. Um, we are unique. So, um, for example, this lady here, there are things about you, about your life, about your knowledge, about your learning, about your talent, your abilities, your character that are absolutely unique. You're not like anybody else. You may share a talent. You may be good on the bassoon and there's someone over here who can play the bassoon too. Yeah, but your combination of things is unique. Not only do you look completely different, I mean, if you look around, nobody looks like you. Or if they do, uh, it's similar, unless you're a monozygotic twin, they look different. But that's just the looks. Your, yourself, your, your, your consciousness, your id, your ego, your superego, completely different from everybody else. For example, everybody's awake but that man right there. He's completely unique. <laughs> Actually, he's just resting his eyes because he smiled. <laughs> I sometimes check my eyelids for holes, you know. Anyway. <laughs> But that's the first thing to recognize. No one on earth is quite like you. This is easy to understand, but hard to assimilate. I bet you accept what I say, but it's very hard to assimilate and make it part of your yourself, your character. Um, there are things you'll excel at and others that you will suck at. That's, that's a clinical term. Okay, so... Um, I can fly an ultralight. In fact, I, I'm a qualified instructor. Everybody's thinking right now, I would never go up with that. <laughs> <laughs> but let's take sales. I couldn't sell water to a man dying of thirst. My wife can sell snow to Inuits. I mean, uh, my wife is a fantastic sales lady. I cannot do it. Um, there was one time I succeeded. She went in to sell this man, and he just didn't believe women should be selling or doing anything other than being pregnant in the kitchen and barefoot. So she said, you need to sell this guy. I said, I can't sell you. I'm going to mess it up. No, no, go in. I walked in and said, hi, would you like to buy some advertising for our radio? Yeah. <laughs> 
she recognized his deficiency. She didn't take it as, as a, an affront or a slight to her self-esteem. She just said, this guy's a monkey. He wants to be with another monkey. <laughs> Smart lady. And she's very, very uh, independent and feminist in the true sense. She's not constantly slapping me in the face and saying, I'm in charge, I'm in charge. It's none of that. But, but she recognizes the faults of other people. For example, uh, leering policemen. And she gets pulled over and she opens a few buttons and says, Yeah? I'm sorry. I didn't know I was going 120 miles an hour. And by the way, sometimes she does. But she gets away with stuff like that. Except one time we were in, in uh, Chiapas and she didn't use her charm. Uh, we were stopped on the highway by a group of delinquents in, in balaclavas wielding iron poles and saying, and put this a rope across the road and we want money for the children in Guerrero. So she started to lighten to them. You don't even know where Guerrero is. This money's not going to it's going to you. You're gonna go and spend it on yourselves. They're like, oh why she was nuts. And they asked her if she could insult them in Spanish because they weren't quite getting <laughs> And she said yes and she repeated the whole thing in Spanish. And one guy came up and was tapping the windscreen with his pole like I'm gonna break your windscreen. So, they, they let us go with, by, they sprayed our car with black paint, sprayed the, the back license, and uh, I was okay with that because she drives so fast that no policeman was going to see that license. It was like, the license is black, uh, you know. Um, but we went down to Tuxla and we uh, uh, filed a denuncia so that we could have that in the car when the police stopped us and said, you were speeding or whatever, you know. No, no, here's, oh, why do you have black on your license? Well, here's the denuncia, they sprayed us. Uh, we haven't had a chance to clean it yet. Mm -hmm. Also, we were hoping to get a new paint job for the car, but my insurance agent is very smart. He took a cloth and he wiped it all off. <laughs> so we got the same old paint job. But anyway, um, I, I don't know, that's neither here nor there. But anyway, <laughs> generally, she can understand people's... Um, uh, you know, their characters, where their self-esteem is, and how she can manipulate it. <laughs> in fact, I think that's, that's why she gets away all the time in our family. Thank you so much. Thank you. God. Decent man. Okay. Now, recognize your victories. Not just, uh, I can fish well, but, you know, get on the phone and say, look, there's this thing on my uh, visa. I didn't, I didn't make this. Uh, expenditure. Well, sir, you're going to have to blah, blah. Yes, I understand that. And thank you very much for helping me that way. And you, you get the woman around or the, the person around to saying, okay, I'll take care of that. That's a victory. Recognize it. I was really diplomatic. And I turned that situation around. You know? Um, but that's, that's not the only victories. Uh, for example, a friend comes in depressed, upset for some reason or other. And you speak to that friend. And you point out a few realities, which, when they're in the normal, uh, normal frame of mind, they could figure out themselves. But because they're depressed and they're upset, they can't. And you, being in a normal uh, frame of mind, you, you point out these uh, factors they're not factoring in, and you help them. That's a victory. And yes, pat yourself on the back—not literally, but I mean, you know, just yeah, I help that person. Recognize these victories and that will raise your self-esteem. Don't list your faults when you meet someone. Like, hi Salim, I'm, I'm really overweight, and I, I don't have any hair. And, uh, even if you're doing it like in, in jest, hi, I'm a bit overweight right now, but I'm, I'm, I'm on a diet, and it, it's gonna work. People are not looking at you. People are, when, when you meet someone for the first time, they're wondering, what, what, what does he see with me? What's wrong with me? If you spend your energy putting other people at ease, you forget about your own problems. You forget about your own uh, inadequacies. You say, hi, how are you? Recognize that that person is saying, I wonder if he thinks I'm overweight, or I wonder if he thinks I'm too skinny, or I wonder if he thinks la la la. Put them at their ease. Hi, it's lovely to meet you. Uh, where are you from? Oh, I love that accent, you know, whatever it is you like. Mm -hmm. Uh, nice shoes. Don't and never compliment if you don't really. Don't be insincere. Never. People can sense it. Like for example, uh, you're a beautiful woman, but that your granny's army boots 
just doesn't yeah. suit you. So I would never say, wow, nice boots. She could tell, she would know. But I tell her I love her hair, and, and I do. But sh she'll know, people can sense that. But anyway, that's the way. Put other people at their ease, and you will stop feeling ill at ease. Um, preconceptions are bad. Oh, I told you about that. Uh, let's see. Get involved in projects uh, to which you can provide a service. So in other words, if you're an accountant, if you want to get involved in a project like a, a charity or something, do the accounting part. Don't say, well, I'll, I'll shovel out the... Yeah, you're not good at that. Do what you can do to help them and feel good. You, you, you succeed. You do your thing and you succeed. And then, of course, tell yourself, yeah, I did that. Acknowledge that victory. Um, don't believe the lies perpetrated by Madison Avenue or their ilk. When I first came to America, I saw this advertisement. This woman uh, said, my dog Fluffy had just won first prize. When I bent down and lifted him up, my stockings won the booby prize. Because the stockings got all kind of stretched out. And boy, I should get legs or one of the Hanes or whatever. <laughs> my God, creating a sense of inadequacy, creating an inferiority complex so you'll buy their product. They do that. They create that need by saying, oh, people are looking at your stockings and if they're bagging, boy, you know, people are going to reject you. That's not true. Nobody's looking at your bloody stockings. You know, and don't buy this stuff that says you're not a man and that's not a man unless he smokes the same cigarettes as me, that kind of stuff, you know. Uh, that was from uh, Satisfaction, one of the greatest songs ever written. I'm afraid I can't quote Leonard Cohen, which would probably be better. Uh, but the most important thing is, and this is the final thing, know thyself. Know yourself. Know your strengths and weaknesses. And realize how unique you are. You know, I, Wendy here, a uh, fabulous person, lovely personality, I wouldn't ask her to lift, say, my full tinaco off the roof and put it somewhere else. <laughs> she couldn't. She doesn't have the, the power. But I might ask that man right there. <laughs> but then I'm not going to ask him to play the saxophone. Anyway, so know thyself. That is the last little piece of information I'm going to give you. Unfortunately, it's a very shallow kind of a treatment of this. It's a huge subject. Okay. <laughs> and I'm very proud of my granny because I walk a long way to get here. Yeah, what's your granny doing now for <laughs> So it questions anybody. By the way, I wanted to say, uh, I spoke to Jim and I, he said I could do this. This is my movie. We made it here locally with local actors and local Mexicans. It's subtitled in English and subtitled in Spanish when they're speaking English, subtitled in English when they're speaking Spanish. Uh, we had a great, what was it called, a premiere. Just wonderful. Everybody turned up, all the actors in, in evening gowns and that kind of stuff. I hired a limousine, but I couldn't afford more than one, so they all walked through the back doors of the limousine. Like, we filmed them coming out. So they all looked like they arrived in the limousine. Uh, and we got these little golf carts to take them like 20 feet from the limousine to where the interviews were being held on a red carpet. Oh, we did it up big. Now, a lot of people were snowbirds, and so they didn't get a chance to see the film. You've got another chance now. This is the Snowbird special screening. It's, it's a comedy. It's a mockumentary. Anybody know what that is? Okay. Uh, anybody not know, I should say? Yes. It's uh, like a documentary, but it's scripted. It's funny, they're, they're like giving interviews, but, uh, you know, all right. So, um, it's a comedy, it's a, a hundred minutes long, so that's an hour 40. It'll be at the um, uh, Plaza Bugambillas. You can get tickets there, or that beautiful lady with the spiky hair and the blue, that looks like she fell into a can of blue paint. <laughs> she has tickets. And the name of it is Thriller in Ahihik. Oh. Oh, yeah. It's Saturday, uh, this coming Saturday at 10.30 a.m. at the theaters. There's only 216 seats, folks. The premiere had 310, and we had to turn people away. Uh, so get your ticket as soon as you can. It's 75 pesos. 
uh, that's a fundraiser for Red Cross to pay the theater, etc., etc., et and the and the promotions. So uh, yeah, any questions? Yeah, the the routine is the same. You raise your hand, someone will bring you the mic and hold the mic so you can clearly hear your own voice. Which anyone who's been to school knows. <laughs> we forget. Oh, this is a good talk. Does uh, self-esteem involve comparing yourself to other people? Yes, very Why? much so. Why? Um, it's a natural uh, propensity we have. So, so you're judging whether you're better or not? Exactly, or whether someone is better than you. Yeah. For example, if I start saying, if I start comparing myself, Christ, that guy's tall. I wish I had more height, you know. And now my self-esteem is suffering because you're taller than me, you know, which is but, silly. But that's your problem. Not exactly, mine. exactly. It's not your problem. <laughs> no. But you're not, you're not comparing yourself to other people as you're better than them. Because I don't believe comparing yourself to other people yeah. makes any sense. You got I agree with you, a hundred percent. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Any other questions? That lady right there. Hello. Yes. In, I read recently, especially women, they have tendency to be nice, nice, nice. And I was always surprised what it's all about. And they said, like uh, in early life, the way they were treated by mother, by father, or somebody else. And what is your opinion? People, they want to change. Yes. But they go even for counseling. And it takes long, very long. And some people, they get disappointed. Yes. They say it doesn't work. And they stick the same theory. They want to please everybody. But you are giving good example. Like, for example, I am not good salesman. I will not sell. And go and ask, and they give little uh, ideas to, to do it. Yes. And goes and sells like you were selling, and work. It and works. they, they yes. are afraid like people, they're going to reject them. Right. They, like at work, they want to take advantage because they are goody-goody, stay after work, stay this, this, and suddenly ask them, tell them, you will not do it. Right. Uh, they do it and works. But you think it's a very long process to change, or it depends on what? It's individual. It's a long process for some people, and for some people, very short process. For me, it's long because I'm not too smart. But I'll tell my wife something, she'll change it like that. You know, uh, I'll say, uh, if you're, like, for example, uh, you swing around at night in your sleep and you beat me up. Okay, she changes that. She rolls over that way and doesn't beat me up anymore. Uh, for me, it's, it's difficult. I like selling for me is just insane. I, and it is. She says you've got to be uh, able to take a lot of rejection. I, it's, for me, it's like, you don't want it, you don't want it, okay, I guess it's not valuable, uh, you know, and I accept that. Just different for different people, though. Any other questions? Yes. Salim. Thank you. How do we know? Uh, See, we all have a little bit of self-esteem issues. Now, how do we know whether the self-esteem issues that we have are pathological or normal? Is there anything like a chart or a form? <laughs> <laughs> no, good, good, good question, very good question. Um, there is a continuum, as you say, but let me just say to all of you here, none of you are pathologically self-esteem wise. You, 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 you don't, any of you, None of you have uh, pathologically high self-esteem, well, except for, for uh, Alex Bertan <laughs> and uh, Donald Trump, but nobody here uh, has that. It's, it's, it's only in extremes where you have to go and see people like, uh, like Bliss over there. Um, uh, your self-esteem generally, if you're a functioning human being, you're fine. Um, but this, we're talking about a small area in the continuum where it is better to be here than here. So these are ways to get further up and further up. You don't want to get to the point where you think, um, well, you know, I, I can fly. Look at this. Look, I'll just fly now and you jump off a building. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can't fly. You know, you're rational. You're logical. Any other questions? Yes. 
If you can't love yourself, other people will find it very hard to love you too. Yes. And that's number one. Right. Um, yes, uh, I, I have loved myself quite a lot when I was a teenager. <laughs> <laughs> that's just a joke. No, but that's absolutely true. I don't want to trivialize what that lady says. Yes, you must. Your self-esteem, I mean, if you come in and you're like, you know, nobody wants to know you because you're probably boring and you're all, you know, introverted and stuff. No. You, you have to have some confidence and some, you got to know yourself. I mean, it, it all comes down to that. Like, this woman here with beautiful taste in clothing. Do you know you have lovely taste? You did before I said that? <laughs> See, she didn't know that, but she has. She's got a lovely eye for color and the things that match. This man with his hat is beautifully adorned. In fact, I'm going to copy you when I get home. Um, no, really, honestly, because I think he has good taste. I, I like a feather and a flower and, you know, a stick and a cockroach, whatever. Um, but, but know that, you know, everyone, look at the Wendy's choice in glasses. That just lights up her face, and she's a happy, lovely person, you know? So, yeah, you know yourself, and uh, it's very important to try to move your self-esteem up the continuum, because you're a much more pleasant person to be with. Yes? What do you do if somebody wants to change you? What do you do if somebody wants to change you? Um, yes, if they want to change you uh, to a positive, in a positive way, listen to them. You don't have to, but you change yourself for yourself. I had a friend called Nora Adams. She used to dance with the Joffrey Ballet. Anybody have ever heard of the Joffrey Ballet? Yeah. T absolute fantastic American ballet. It is top-notch, I mean, really. And uh, she used to teach for me at my ballet school, and uh, I paid her $30 an hour, and she, which in that little town was enormous. I got lots of flack from the local businesses. But um, one day, she, we were planning her first uh, uh, show with the kids, and she wanted to do Peter Pan. I said, great. I said, do you want me to fly her in, you know, in other words, get rails and on cables flying Peter Pan. No, I'm not flying in anyone. Okay, well, just, well, I don't want you to mess with the integrity of my show. I said, absolutely, I won't. I'm paying for the damn thing, but I'm not going to mess with the integrity of it. You're the artistic person. But I said, and she said, um, but I said, you know, Nora, you are a very talented, very experienced, wonderful teacher. Oh, stop patronizing me. I wasn't. I was being absolutely sincere. I said, wait a minute. I'm going to get to the part where I'm pretty good too. So let me finish recognizing your talents. You're talented. Your uh, ability is amazing. You're a great dancer. You're a great teacher. But I have a few talents too. So when I make a suggestion, don't just discard it. Take it. Doesn't fit? Okay. Take it. Think about, oh, that might be good. Okay. All I'm saying, but see, when you have low self-esteem, a person with low self-esteem, you can sincerely compliment them, and they'll say, oh, you're patronizing me, or you're really putting me down. It's, it's a very vicious cycle, and you can't get out of it. And then, then you start thinking everybody's putting you down when some people are sincerely complimenting you, you know? So low self-esteem is terribly, terribly destructive. Yes. I'm giving you the look. The look, okay. <laughs> okay, thank you for a wonderful okay. presentation. <laughs> else. Now don't forget next week, come back for the Russians. Even if you saw it before, you will get so much more out of it. And that's all literature and music and uh, uh, Russian singer and poetry. Oh, it's going to be wonderful. So next week, same time, same place. Uh, please stack your chairs and dispose correctly of your coffee cups. Or turn on your cell phone. <laughs> Do that with something else.